Hi everyone, this is Dallin Wortham, one of the hosts of the Charter School Connection podcast. In this episode, I meet with David Robinson from School Lane out in Pennsylvania. He has a very unique journey visiting a lot of different countries to get to where he is today in the charter school world. He gives a lot of really good insights in regards to how to stay true to your charter school, how to grow it, how to make it something special. And he's been in the charter school world for a while now, and School Lane has been in since the, <laughs> since the 20th century. I, get, I think they were founded back in like 1999. So go check them out. They have a lot of good insights. Listen to this podcast. And um, if you get a small fraction of the value that I did, then it will be well worth the listen. So without further ado, here's David Robinson. We'd like to thank our sponsors, obviously Charter Connect. You plus Charter Connect equals more students. Whether you are in the cycle year after year of struggling to reach enrollment goals and wondering, is this gonna be a good year? Is this gonna be a bad year? Are we gonna have enough students to fill our classrooms? Or if you're doing actually pretty well with enrollment, but you're just looking to stay on top of the rest of your competition, schedule a free marketing consultation with one of our enrollment specialists. We've helped hundreds of charter schools across the country to make enrollment issues a thing of the past. So go ahead and schedule that free marketing consultation by visiting charterconnect.co. And our new enrollment software, Enrolio. Enrolio is easy, simple, and it automates your enrollment so that parents and students slip through to your enrollment process and into your school. There's no need to be spending a lot of money for all these really expensive um, enrollment platforms and third-party tools just to lead to disappointing enrollment. So go ahead and go check out Enrolio and schedule your free demo to learn how Enrolio can take your enrollment to the next level. Without further ado, let's get to this podcast episode. Thank you so much, everyone. Hi everyone, this is Dallin Worthen with the Charter School Connection Podcast. Um, today is Monday, March 6th, and I'm really excited because um, the guest on today's show, I am just now barely meeting, um, but from the research that I've done on their school and from the information that I've learned recently about David Robinson is we got some really exciting and a very unique path to the charter school world. So I'm excited to hear his insights so that we can share his insights and experience with you. So without further ado, David, welcome to the podcast. All right. Thanks so much, Don. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's not easy finding time as a charter school administrator to do things like this. Um, time is very valuable. So the fact that you're taking a little bit of time out of your day to be here means a lot. Um, yeah. So pretty much um, we were chatting a little bit before we started recording, and I just want to get this on on the, um, the episode now, so I'm just going to ask it again. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved into education in the charter school world, because I think your story, everyone has a unique one, but I think yours is a little, it has yeah, some. Weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so um, when I graduated college, I actually graduated with an English major. Um, and wasn't sure what I wanted to do next. I had no training in education. Um, I just wanted to live overseas. Um, and the way to do that was to te teach English in another country, um, primarily in Asia. Um, so I actually ended up in Taiwan um, and I taught English as a second language in like a for-profit school organization that um, they call them cram schools. Um, and so I taught there um, pre-K all the way through 12th grade. Had no training whatsoever my first wow. Um, day in the classroom was uh, my second day in Taiwan and nobody spoke English <laughs> in my classroom and I just sort of had to figure it out. Um, so trial by far, I know is like the norm in education is certainly that's true for me. And and how um, how old were you, if you don't mind me asking, when you went? Over I was I was 22. Um, it was actually um, 2002 to 2003. It was actually, this is not my first pandemic that I lived through. I was there in SARS. Uh, I did teach kids in oh, math no. before this too. Oh, wow. So this is not your first rodeo then. Yeah. Uh, and what did uh, your family think? Were they just like, all right, see you later, David? Yeah, or I mean, they were very supportive. Um, you know, they um, they got nervous towards the end when SARS was sort of starting to peak. Um, so I did yeah. come a little bit early. Um, but um, no, they were they were really supportive. They were great about it. And what was that experience like? What, um, I guess every experience obviously leads to learning opportunities and whatnot. But tell us about it. Didn't what, what was it like being over yeah, there? Yeah, I mean, I think um, from a cultural perspective, it was huge for me, right? Like, you know, to live um, in the, the 
the Eastern Hemisphere, where like it's really not necessarily related to the Western Hemisphere cultural backgrounds. I mean, I think the culture shock and just understanding how different places can be is really eye opening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, from an education perspective, I think what I learned is that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, <laughs> so I came back to try to learn that. Um, uh-huh. But also just, you know, culturally how serious school was there. Um, you know, they came to me after school. So their kids there were in school all day. And then they came to me to go to school after school for two hours. Wow. Um, and so, you know, competition was fierce. You know, it's heavily overpopulated there. Um, and so, um, but also I think they just really, really respect education and, and have, high regards for it um so um it was eye-opening in that way too but but i think mostly it was just that like i didn't know what i was doing and i had to learn how to teach gotcha uh, so i kind of guess like my next spot which was um you know i got i got a teaching cert in the united states and did some substitute teaching in my home county in maryland and then um, got a job in costa rica at a private school um so i taught fourth grade at an international baccalaureate school there um, for a couple years um, and then i came back and moved to Philadelphia, um, where I met my wife, and um, I got a job as the admissions counselor at Temple University. And each admissions counselor gets like a, a region to recruit at. Um, mm-hmm. So my region was the city of Philadelphia, and much like every other city, like the, I think what was eye opening for me was seeing, you know, an elite private school um, in one visit, and then same day I'd go to you know a neighborhood school in a very tough neighborhood. And just seeing the disparity, you know, in one, I'd be sort of being grilled about whether Temple was a good enough school for them or not. And then the other one, you know, they wouldn't have even thought about college yet. Yeah. Wow. So um, that was, you know, for me, um, not having the background in, in, in not growing up in a city, I think it was shocking to see. So I felt like I wanted to work in the city. So I started working in the Philadelphia School District um, next in a program called Gear Up, uh, where I was basically a counselor for the students from seventh grade and then I followed them all the way through their high school so from seventh and eighth and they're like five different middle schools I then went with them all to this neighborhood high school um, in ninth grade Um, it was just a resource for them Um, I really wanted to stay in the Philly school district I really loved the work I was doing there Um, I was getting my administrative cert at the time Um, but the Philadelphia school districts like bottom fell out at that time and they were cutting teachers and um, it just didn't seem like a good time Um, and I had a um, a personal contact with someone at a, whose husband worked at a, a chart was starting starting to become a principal at, at a charter school um, mm-hmm. in Wilmington as a turnaround school. So um, I took a job as the vice principal there, um, and I was there for four or five years, mostly as vice principal and then principal. Um, and I loved it there. It, it was a very very tough neighborhood. A lot of um, you know intergenerational poverty um, like extreme poverty um, so just a lot of trauma and, and issues that came with it I felt like really meaningful work but it was it was a lot of hours and I didn't have a family when I started and then by the time I was four years in I had two little kids and I, I needed something a little more sustainable for me yeah. plus the commute um, was like a couple hour commute for me so um, I took an opportunity here at school lane um, in Ben Salem I started as vice principal of grades four to six um, and then I became the principal two years later and I've been here for six years since. So this is my eighth year at school lane and my sixth year principal. Wow. That's an awesome journey. And um, tell us a little bit about school lane. So if um, someone doesn't know anything about school lane, tell us a little bit about um, how it started, what makes your school unique and, and things of that nature so that we can get a better yeah. school. Yeah, it, it's a super unique school and, I, and it was definitely part of what drew me to it. Um, you know, in Pennsylvania, it was actually the first um, elementary school outside of a city. So it was the first um, like suburban elementary charter school um, it started in 1999. So it's been around a while now. Um, yeah, for the charter school world, that's that's a long time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's very unique um, in its approach. So um, it has a mission and vision um, that really draws a lot of people to it. Um, and you can you can see it on the website, but um, essentially, you know, really have worked on creating a sanctuary for students, which to me um, sort of speaks to trauma-informed practices, which is sort of all the buzz now, but really sort of been true of school lane for 20 years. Um, And then the other piece that has always been true here is um, like an inquiry-based approach to instruction. So again, not something that I think was on a lot of people's radar 20 years ago, um, but has been part of this school for a long time. 
Um, so uh, I really loved um, that it was a place that really focused on intrinsic motivation for kids and having relationships with them um, and teaching them to be like citizens, you know, not just here's what you need to know for the test, um, but really focusing on like raising good people. Um, and, and that felt like it aligned philosophically for me. And that's why I felt like a great fit. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think those are really unique things. Um, but also in the charter school world, it's really easy to say like, oh yeah, we are project-based or STEM and it's easy to say certain things and it's harder to actually do what you say. So I would, and obviously School Lane is doing it because you've been around for so long. So, so how does School Lane walk the walks so that if a charter school is listening to this episode and they're having a hard time actually doing what they're saying, what tips do you have that has helped School Lane to actually walk the walk? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that jumps out to me, you know, having um, worked in a charter school before this is you can feel really alone, right? Um, and sort of being doing things on your own. Um, but there's so many organizations out there that can work with you. Um, and so I would encourage everyone to do that. So a big thing that School Lane did really before I got here, as they started expanding to the older grades, they decided to partner with the International Baccalaureate Program. Um, and so they got the certification for that for grades um, uh, at the time, six to 12, it's now seven to 12. Um, and so that's not something I'm necessarily personally involved in, but to be an IB school, you know, you need to do a certain level of work to keep that certification up. Um, and so those types of partnerships really sort of push the envelope of what you can do and what you have to do. Um, and, and here at the elementary campus, I also think it just comes down to um, a lot of culturally, you know, having teachers who want to do, be a part of doing that type of work um, and then supporting them with it because it, it, it's not easy and, and it's not something that we're perfect at and, and do all the time. Um, but it's something that everyone who's here understands that this is part of what we do and part of what we strive to do and, and, and they're here because of it. Uh, I love that answer. And as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as a podcast host, we're not supposed to hope that you say certain things. We're just supposed to just let you say whatever you want to say but um i was kind of in the back of my mind like oh, i hope that he talks about something about like systems or certifications or something because it's so easy to say like oh yeah we are this and to have no accountability nothing to have to maintain but when you have like a certification or a system or a program or a third party something to help you just kind of stay accountable to you know what you would like to be accountable for i think that's huge instead of just kind of relying on your own willpower to to be able to do it so i think that was a fantastic answer thank you so much yeah, yeah. Um, very cool and um so school lane is unique because of all these different um because of the certifications because of um focusing on making sure that students become good citizens and giving them you know the emotional support that they need there's a lot of different things that you mentioned um, and I feel like to be able to maintain that identity, you have to have a staff that also accepts and adopts that um, philosophy. So how do you go about hiring teachers and faculty members that are going to carry forth that vision um, to the student body and to the parents and community? Sure. Um, well, it's not easy. I think it starts with um, it starts with the teachers who have been here longer than me. Um, to be honest, like they, they get a lot of credit because, you know, they've been doing it a long time and they can, you know, they're the ones in the trenches with the other teachers showing them what to do and, and set that expectation. Um, I think as a principal, it's partly my job to hold everyone accountable to that expectation and, and honor those who are, um, who are meeting that expectation and, and hold them up um, as models. Um, you know, I think on the hiring side, um, what I really love about charter schools is that I can cut the bureaucracy of it um, and be really personally involved. So um, me and, and my vice principals, we do all the interviewing. Uh, we do the phone screening. Um, we do the in-person interview. Um, and even when we make the job offer, I might consult HR um, to say, hey, what is the salary going to be for this person? And when is their start date? But then I will make the personal call um, to be able to tell them like, hey, um, you know, loved what you had to say and, and really want you to be here just so, um, you know, I can have that personal touch and personal involvement, um, 
rather than it going through all these different steps that happen in a district. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think um, even going back to the sort of the question of like, how do I get people who are aligned to what we want to do is, is being upfront. You know, an interview is a two way interview. It's not, I don't see it as one way. I'm trying to tell them who we are um, and not trying to sell it, but more being upfront. Um, on who we are and what we do so that they can make the best choice for them too. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, later on, if they're not a fit, you know, another benefit of the charter school is like, it's, you, I have the ability to exit somebody if I need to. Mm -hmm. And that's not my goal, but um, is my goal to have everyone who's sort of aligned and working towards our mission and vision for sure. Awesome. I think that's awesome. And I guess just a follow-up question is I know that a couple schools um, after they've heard me ask that question and they've listened to the answers, their follow-up question is, that's great and all, but what if we really need teachers, like we need them bad and we we need to hire and we don't really have the, the luxury of, you know, making sure that they're exactly what we're looking for and align sure. with our vision because we need students or we need um, teachers really bad. How would you respond to someone that asked that question? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think every um, school system is probably facing that right now with the teacher shortages where they are. I certainly have noticed a difference myself in the last five years in terms of the amount of applicants we have. And I think then you're looking for um, more someone who can be coached and, and, um, and is open and, and wants to learn and grow to meet the mission and vision. Um, and then having systems in place at your school that will support that person. Um, so we added um, a position last year of an instructional coach who's one of our um, people who's been teaching here for over um, you know, like 10 to 15 years. So she's able to go in and, and give that coaching support along with the administrator that's coaching as well, uh, but just to show them the way and give them support. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just having this, you know, we're in a position now where you, know, you aren't going to get to just choose some elite teacher from a huge pool of applicants. You might be choosing people who are less experienced, but they, um, they're also more open-minded because they haven't done it before. They don't know. Um, yeah this is what works for me or not um, and so we can show them our way of doing it um, but then also just making sure you have those systems to help those people too awesome yeah I, I don't think I'm giving you softball questions but you're still hitting them out of the park so thanks <laughs> for that. I think that's great I love that response um, fantastic and I don't think I've really heard that one either so well cool and every school um, whether they're growing or they're not growing um there's growing pains there's recessions there's not really knowing how you're going to be able to renew your charter and there's or how you're going to fill your classrooms next year and there's dark you know moments and uncertainty how does school lane get through those tough times that every charter school goes through um, what tips do you have for someone that is maybe um in one of those moments where they're not really sure what the next step is how, how have you handled that in the past? Yeah, I mean, there's been plenty of those moments over the last few years with the pandemic and political unrest and things like that. So, um, you know, I think all of us have mm -hmm. some stories of those. I mean, I think the first thing to me is to name it. Um, I think when you don't name it, it sort of feels um, yeah. like it's talked about in, in whispers. Um, and so it, sometimes it just feels validating for everyone, for the leader to say, hey, this is what's happening. Um, and I recognize that, um, not even necessarily to have solutions, um, but, but just to name it would be, to me, the start. Um, and, then, and then the next step is to, once you name it, is you have to, you have to start working on it. Um, and so a couple of examples for me. Um, one is, um, you know, this idea of, of um, what you can and can't teach in school and, and culturally what you're talking about and what you're not talking about um, was something where I felt like, we could either say, well, we're not going to touch anything. We're not going to talk about religions. We're not going to talk about cultures, you know, hands off. Um, but we sort of went the opposite way with it. We have an extremely diverse school. It's another thing that makes it really unique um, is that we're diverse ethnically. We're diverse socioeconomically. We're diverse politically. Um, you know, our student population is really representative of the United States in a lot of ways. Um, and so one of the things we did that was really small that had a huge impact was um, we decided to honor um, a lot of holidays rather than honor none, um, which I think was the place we were sort of leaning to before. But um, we have a large Indian population, so we honor Diwali at our school. 
um, as well as we honor Christmas and um, Rosh Hashanah um, and Eid because we have some uh, Muslim families. So, um, you know, and then we do a big thing for Veterans Day and Constitution Day um, and, um, you know, Earth Day and, and um, things like that. So it's sort of rather, it took a little work up front, right? It was like, oh gosh, are we really gonna try to hit all these holidays? But once we did it, um, it really made a difference. And you just don't know what, I didn't think that's what it was going to do, right? Mm -hmm. I felt like, oh, here's something nice I can say I'm doing. Um, I didn't think it was going to have the, the large impact that it did. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's it's leaning into something to, to name it and then to lean into it and really try and put yourself out there. Um, because then other people start to come up with other ideas or thoughts of ways they can do something and it, and it sort of builds on itself. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Um, you can correct me if I if I understood this wrong, but I feel like it's very common when things start to sputter in, in, in the charter school world that that happens, everyone goes through it to go, okay, I need to reel it back in and become more vanilla and be more like everyone else, be more like the public schools. Um, but you kind of said, actually, we painted ourselves to be more colorful. We um, opened ourselves up to be more unique rather than more... <laughs> Like everyone else and that made the difference which is kind of scary because you're taking a leap of faith a little bit but is that the case yeah um i think it's um so important to um I, i'm in the charter school world because it's exciting because i have um, that ability to change things or do things differently um, i want to do those things um, i want to make those changes um and I want to try and I want to put myself out there and put my school out there um, that if I wanted it to be vanilla, that I would, you know, go to a place with a larger bureaucracy that might not let me do the things that I can do as a principal who's, who's in the trenches of a school. Um, so, yeah, and I, I think that's the way this school is built. Um, right? it, it, it's bigger than me. It's, it's the mission and vision of the school um, that allows me to, to be that way. Yeah, I just want to echo what you just said. Um, I ask that question a lot about charter schools and we get a ton of great answers. Um, they say, oh, because I want to help children or I, or I want to forward education in America or I want to help um, underprivileged students or help, you know, lessen the gap in some areas. And those are all great answers, but those can all be said in nursing or in public schools or in if you want to be a lawyer. Um, they're, they're, those are kind of vague answers. And what you just said is like, because it's exciting. It's like, yes, someone finally said it um, because all of those answers are great, but why charter schools? Why not a public school when you can do all those things in a normal public school? You can make a difference there or in a private school or in a community college. Why charter? And you just said it because it's exciting, it's new, it's the it's a little bit, you have a little bit longer of a leash to kind of experiment and explore and awesome. Yeah, but, I mean, I think education is, our education system is broken. Um, mm -hmm. Like that's just the reality of it. And, it. and it's not that you can't make those changes in a public or a private um, versus a charter, but um, I just like the structure of the charter, it just allows me um, to serve um, the public population and also try different things at the level of principle that, you know, my, I might not be able to in a different type of setting. Yeah, fantastic. Very cool. And, and before we move on to the next section, um, while we're kind of on this idea of tips to kind of get out of a rut or to stop spinning your wheels, um, is there anything, and if you don't have a story to share, um, that's perfectly fine, but is there anything that if you could go back in time, you'd say, you know what, I might have done this differently, or I would have maybe um, taken this approach as well, or I would have maybe included this person, um, because that some of our listeners say that that's the most helpful question because they are about to make a big decision, and then they learn from, oh, so-and-so said that. If they could have gone back and done this differently, they would have done this, and I didn't even think of that, so yeah. is it anything um, I could Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's probably a lot of answers for that for me. Um, just in being reflective and knowing that, you know, each year there are things that um, in retrospect, I'm like, oh, we could have done this or this. And uh, that's also what makes the school exciting is that the next year you can, 
you can make those changes or, or um, shifts. Um, for me right now, we're really leaning in hard to the science of reading um, in, in our early literacy program. Um, and I just wish I had done that sooner. Um, we had some things in place here at School Dane that supported the science of reading um, and, and had some of the practices that work with, with what the science says. Um, but I don't think we fully understood how research-backed it was and how um, some of the other practices are not as research-backed. Um, so I think that's something I would have changed. I think one of the things that's been really eye-opening to me this year, um, you know, I don't know if you've listened to the podcast, Sold the Story, um, but that's like a really, really powerful one right now on, on the science of reading and, and how, it, how we've known it for 20, 25 years and it's been sort of pushed down. Um, through other education organizations pushing other agendas. I think everything is framed to you as research backed, um, but to understand a little bit better what, what actually is getting the research um, that's really valid and what isn't um, and where the research is coming from and how many studies have been done. Um, it's not something you think about as a school leader or as a teacher, um, but it's important to recognize just so you can have that critical thinking of looking at okay, this article or this resource tells me that this is true, but mm -hmm. what's backing that up, um, you know, is, is just been eye-opening me, for me this year. And so I think the place where we took a bad turn that I'd like to, that we're turning back now and that I wish we had done sooner is just on that time to reading piece. That's fantastic. Um, could you repeat the name of the podcast? Yeah, it's called Sold a Story um, Sold by to Emily Story. Hanford. Fantastic. I'm going to include that in the show notes so that if anyone sure. wants to listen to that podcast, um, there will be a link on the um, podcast episode um, page on our website. So fantastic. Very cool. I was not expecting that answer and I'm glad you gave it. <laughs> so um, David, if you could um, maybe mention any sort of other books or podcasts or maybe YouTube videos, things that sure. maybe you recommend saying like, hey, I read this book and it kind of opened my eyes to maybe a new perspective of running my charter school yeah. or of teaching that we can add to the show notes. Yeah, I mean, I there's a lot, um, but you know, for me, before we did the reading path, we really shifted the way we taught math. Um, and so the, the first thing that changed for us was, um, uh, Dan Meyer's TED Talk. Um, okay. I can't remember the name of it, but um, you can look him up. It's M E Y E R, Dan Meyer. Um, and then I yeah. saw him speak. He's just an incredible, he's a high school math teacher, but um, what he said to me was really true for elementary. And then uh, a book that followed from that um, by Joe Bowler is called Mathematical Mindsets. Um, and so that's, that's a really great one on making you think about the meaning of mathematics and, and what we teach and how we teach it in math, uh, especially for elementary world where I think teachers get into teaching elementary because they like to teach how to read, they don't like teaching math. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for our staff, learning about the value of math and the ways to teach it was, was really great. Uh, the other thing that was really valuable for us as a school was responsive classroom. Um, most of our teachers have been to the responsive classroom four day um, institute in the summer for training on setting a classroom environment and um, thinking about developmental stages of children. Uh, and so that for classroom management um, has been just such a valuable tool. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, these notes are golden. So anyone interested in these links, they'll be in the show notes. So great, very cool. Um, so with School Lane, um, it's been around for well over 20 years now. What's the next goal? What's the next thing that you see on the horizon um, that will that maybe School Lane is currently working towards? Yeah, I mean, I think um, with inquiry, you can always continue to get better and grow. Um, and I think I always ask these questions to my staff of what I call are like these unanswerable questions about school. One of which is like, what is the point of school, right? Like, what what are we trying to do? Mm -hmm. um, what's important for children to learn in school and what isn't anymore. Um, because I think ultimately, as an elementary school, we need to give them some foundational skills, right? Like reading and, and, um, and 
math skills and writing skills that are foundation. Those are, those will always be true, even with things like ChatGPT in the world now. Mm -hmm. You still need to know what good reading and writing and math looks like. Um, but I also think innovation and creativity are are essential as well because you don't know what the world is going to look like uh, when these children are adults and and what what they're going to need to be able to contribute in society. Um, so continuing to, to learn how to do inquiry-based instruction um, in a way that um, impacts the local community, uh, I think is just so important and something that um, I'm really hoping to continue to, to learn and grow um, within School Lane over the next few years. Fantastic. Yeah, and there's a lot of different answers that I get for that question. Some are like, have a new gymnasium, expand to a campus, um, hire more teachers, um, start a robotics team. And um, that one is obviously more qualitative than like, here's a physical thing that we did and yay us, let's raise a flag about it. And I think it's just as or even more valid. So to be focusing on internal things that maybe aren't seen from the outside of your school building. So yeah, I mean, we're into like, what can we, what are we doing that we can do even better rather than what can we add or, or show that it looks nice. Um, mm -hmm. I just think, again, that excitement of, of trying to, to change things, to make things different and new um, in education is what, what drew me to school lane to begin with. Yeah, awesome, fantastic. Um, typically we don't um, wrap up with this question, so we probably won't wrap up with it, but it is towards the end. Um, and some um, administrators have a lot to say and some don't have anything to say. Um, with this question, but is there anything that maybe you'd like to see with your local, state, or federal government in regards to education or charter schools that you'd like to mention? Yeah, I mean, I think the number one thing is funding. Um, yeah. You know, with COVID right now, we actually have, um, you know, I feel really well supported with funding, um, but I also know that that's coming to a close next year. Uh, and I'm really concerned for all schools with funding when that ends. I really hope that all governments decide, you know what, we need to continue to, uh, to support the, the local schools, uh, because I just see so much of what's happening in society and, and what we could do better begins with education. Um, and with the teacher shortage, I think things need to be done around compensating teachers fairly um, so that they feel valued. It feels like a highly regarded um, profession that people want to achieve and, and get to. Um, and so to do that, you have to be compensated for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just, I really hope that that, that the COVID funding opened everybody's eyes in, in politics to the amount of funding that's needed to effectively run a school uh, and that that doesn't stop after COVID. Awesome. No, I, yep. Amen. And I, and I think that's a, a common one. So fantastic. Well, um, David, Mr. Robinson, um, is there anything that you'd like to share, anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up, something that um, maybe a, a question that I didn't ask, but you have an answer to? Um, no, I'm, I mean, I, I don't think so, no. Well, fantastic. Um, we're super grateful for the time that you've given. Um, you're just like every single one of our guests, we haven't had a bad guest on the podcast. Um, it was very insightful. I am learning a lot. I feel like I'm I'm cheating the system, getting all these insights um, for free. Um, <laughs> um, but I really appreciate all your insights. I know that our listeners will really appreciate it. We're going to have all of the links to the show notes. We're going to be linking to School Lane. Um, so if anyone wants to learn more about school lane or anything that um, Mr. Robinson has mentioned, or if you know anyone that lives in uh, Ben Salem is what it's called, yep. <laughs> the city in Pennsylvania. Yep. Yeah, it's right outside Philly. Yeah, um, make sure to check out school lane and uh, enroll your students there. But fantastic. Um, thank you so much for being a part of the, the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Don. All right, bye now.